uh, at reaction number three. So allow me, if you will, to wrap up all this stuff so that since we have this information, so that I can quickly explain this reaction. Is that okay? Great. Alright. This is fine. Okay, this didn't go too well. Okay, I think the marker has turned on it. Alright, guys, reaction 3, I made it clear this is the special part of glycolysis where regulation is done. Alright, how is reaction 3 regulated? Or maybe interestingly, I can ask a question. And this one, I want you to give it as an assignment two weeks after you and I separate. Alright? Please write this one. Explain how. Explain how glycolysis and gluconeogenesis. Glycolysis and gluconeogenesis are tightly regulated to ensure that the two reactions do not occur simultaneously. Explain how glycolysis and gluconeogenesis are tightly regulated to ensure that the two reactions do not occur simultaneously. Now, here is something that will be very important. You see, there is a special enzyme here called phosphofructokinase 1. Phosphofructokinase 1 is the key enzyme in the regulation of glycolysis. There are many things that will regulate this enzyme. For example, it would be things like uh, the presence of its substrate and also the action of a very special molecule called fructose 2,6 with phosphate. This enzyme is also downregulated by high amounts of ATP and high amounts of citrate, all of which signal that energy has already been produced. However, it is activated by the presence of high amounts of AMP, which means that, for example, if it's in muscles, that there is no energy and there's most tissue that when there's AMP, it means that the ATP has been broken down ATP and further another phosphate has been removed, there is a high need for energy. How is this reaction regulated? To ensure that this does not occur simultaneously with the reverse of this reaction. Friends, I want you to know that this molecule you have here which is your fructose 6-phosphate, like I already alluded to, can be phosphorylated at two points, at carbon number 1 and at carbon number 2. The result of phosphorylating at carbon number 1 is production of fructose 1,6 with phosphate. Well, it is possible that this can go in a direction where phosphate is actually added to carbon number 2. The end product is going to be a fructose 2,6 a fructose 2,6 this phosphate. H here O phosphate and then we have there. 
This is fructose 2 over 6 is phosphate. The enzyme catalyzed in this reaction is referred to as phospho fructokinase 2. Once the phosphate has been added, and this is going to happen particularly when you have consumed a high amount of carbohydrate. Once the phosphate has been added at carbon number 2, it produces fructose 2,6 bisphosphate. This fructose 2,6 bisphosphate has a very special function. Its function is that it has a very strong stimulatory effect. So it has a very strong positive effect on this enzyme here, phosphocytokinase 1. So, apart from phosphorylating this to fructose 1,6 bisphosphate, to go down the glycolytic pathway, fructose 6 phosphate can be phosphorylated at carbon number 2 to produce an intermediate fructose 2,6 bisphosphate, this one here, which will bind to this enzyme and allosterically increase the activity of this enzyme. When this enzyme has been allosterically activated, glycolysis proceeds very fast. The, the product of this reaction is fructose 1,6 bisphosphate, uh, which you would also discover has a feed forward effect on pyruvate kinase and would increase the process of glycolysis all the more. Now, another interesting thing is that apart from having a stimulatory effect on this enzyme, PFK1, it has a stimulatory effect on PFK1, it also has a very strong inhibitory effect on the enzyme, on the enzyme fructose 1,6 this phosphate. Now, what is the function of this enzyme? The function of this enzyme is to catalyze the reverse of this reaction. So, if somebody is in starvation, they need to produce glucose in the process of gluconeogenesis. These reactions that I've shown you, the reversible reaction will reverse and they will start moving backwards to produce glucose. This reaction, where fructose 1.6 bisphosphate was produced, the phosphate would actually be released and it is going to be added back to it is actually going to be converted into fructose 6 phosphate. The enzyme is fructose 1,6 bisphosphatase, which will remove the phosphate there. Now I told you that this product has a stimulatory effect on this molecule, on this enzyme, to increase glycolysis, and at the same time inhibitory effect on the enzyme that does the reverse reaction. And therefore, by maintaining or by monitoring the concentration of fructose 2,6 bisphosphate, glycolysis and gluconeogenesis are regulated to ensure that they do not proceed spontaneously. So the key molecule is just the amount of fructose 2,6 bisphosphate. So in essence, how does this really play out? The enzyme here is Fructokinase, which is a very special enzyme. I want to just briefly explain to you how this is going to play out in reality to ensure that only one reaction is occurring, which is either glycolysis or gluconeogenesis. So here is what happens. When you consume a meal, we have already explained that the carbohydrate-rich meal will lead to increased insulin secretion. Insulin secretion will lead to activation of a phosphoprotein phosphatase. When that phosphoprotein phosphatase enzyme has been activated, it will have a role to dephosphorylate enzymes. One of the enzymes it dephosphorylates is this one, phosphoprotokinase 2. When phosphoprotokinase 2 is dephosphorylated, it becomes active. At the same time, there is another enzyme which is actually part of this same enzyme. This enzyme has two sub-units. It's like, let's say it's one protein, and on one side, 
and there is another side here which has a different function, right? This one side has a P, it has a PFK1, a PFK2 activity, while the other side here has a fructose 2,6 bisphosphatase activity. It's a bifactional enzyme. This side is adding the phosphate at carbon number two. Well, this other side is removing the phosphate to reproduce this. So what is happening is this. When you eat, you have high amounts of insulin. The insulin will lead to dephosphorylation of this entire enzyme. When this enzyme is dephosphorylated, this kinase becomes active. This becomes inactive. The result is that activation of phosphatokinase 2 will lead to production of fructose 2,6 bisphosphate and when fructose 2,6 bisphosphate is produced it will bind to phosphatokinase 1 strongly activate this enzyme and glycolysis produce proceeds at a very quick rate however when you are stopped there is a difference or the reverse of this happening low amounts of glucose leads to secretion of glucagon glucagon will lead to activation of a cyclic AMP dependent protein kinase called protein kinase A, and the effect of this enzyme is to ultimately lead to phosphorylation of other enzymes. The enzyme that will be phosphorylated in this case is this one. Once phosphorylated in a process we call covalent modulation, you will discover that when phosphates are added, this now becomes inactive, this one becomes activated. When the phosphate is activated, the effect is to break down the fructose 2,6 of phosphate so that the amount of this molecule reduces. When the amount of this molecule has reduced, its strong stimulatory effect on phosphofructokinase 1 reduces. Therefore, glycolysis reduces. Its inhibitory effect on fructose 1.6 bisphosphate also reduces and gluconeogenesis proceeds and ultimately leads to production of glucose. Guys, in a nutshell, this could have probably been the only part that I was expecting you to have a bit of a struggle to understand, but from this, you can know that ultimately glycolysis and gluconeogenesis are going to occur at different time due to the concentration of fructose 2,6 bisphosphate, which is depending on the hormones insulin and glucagon, which depends on whether you have eaten or you are starving. Friends, I'm done. Any questions? <laughs>